This is the Mended Paths Podcast with Chadwick Hayward, episode number six. Welcome to MendedPaths.com. Let's get back to bed. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for the sixth episode of the Mended Paths podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Tim Kaufman, who shares his inspirational story of how he used the philosophy of Kaizen, continuous improvement, to mend the path he was on and forge towards a healthier way of life. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Tim. It's great to have you here today. Um, It's great to be here, and thanks for what you do. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I know you're quite athletic now. I see you on Facebook. You do a lot of running, cycling. You're starting swimming, uh, considering doing a triathlon uh, at some point here in the future. You're very conscious about what you eat, but that wasn't always the case. Can you talk about what, where you were, say, prior to 2011 and what your life looked like at that point? So, yeah, well, I guess what led me up to 2011, um, I think is is kind of important too. Uh, my wife and I got married at kind of a young age, so we got kind of tossed into um, the whole grow up really fast when you're 20 years old type of thing. Okay. And I had I grew up on a farm, so I was used to doing manual labor, and um, I went to school to be uh, a machinist and a tool and die maker, and um, so I worked in a factory and around heavy stuff, heavy equipment. It was a very physical job, but what I noticed is. Um, I was like twisting my ankle a lot. Um, my knee would kind of buckle, like things were kind of dislocating. Okay. And it was kind of like, you know, we kind of chalked it up to, well, I'm clumsy or I'm accident prone growing up because I was always getting hurt, always in ACE bandages or whatever. But it got more serious as I got older. And um, in my early 20s, it, it got to the point where I, I basically couldn't use my left arm, I'd, I'd reach over my head and it would just like dislocate, you know, posteriorly. And then it got so bad that I'd actually sneeze and it would dislocate just standing still. So, Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. In fact, some of my doctor visits, they would actually schedule to have other doctors there to look at this. You know, I was kind of, I kind of felt like a circus freak sometime. You were the case study. Yeah. Um, and actually still to this day, they still, I heard they still studied my MRIs and stuff at a uh, university up here. So, oh, wow. So what they found out, they went in there to, to fix my shoulder. They were targeting that specific thing. And as they got in there, they were doing this uh, procedure called an arthroplasty. So they pulled up all my ligaments and tendons and kind of folded them over each other. Okay. And then stitched them to kind of bring that whole capsule back together. And tighten it back up. Oh, wow. Yeah. What they noticed, though, is when they went to stretch everything out, it was stretching way farther than it should. And so what ended up, long story short, I got diagnosed with something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, the hypermobile type. Um, so the collagen in my body has like a mutation that it makes it super, super elastic. So like when I lay down scar tissue, it, it comes out, it almost looks like bubble gum. Oh, wow. And my sister also, one of my sisters has the same thing, and she's been to Yale to get uh, genetic testing and whatnot. And so so that was what they diagnosed me with. Um, I was always in a lot of pain, as you can imagine, like just like when you twist your ankle, you get that inflammation and the pain. Yeah. Um, and basically, since every step I took, my joints would kind of shift. Yeah, so you weren't getting the support that you typically get with a joint. Right. And along with the support, you get the wear. You know, my joints were always wearing, you know, abnormally. So, yeah, there was a ton of pain. And I, I started, in fact, after the surgery, I started on uh, hydrocodone. And I actually, like, never got off of that until well into my, you know, late 30s. And so what is that? Um, so basically, it's lower tab would be the brand name, um, you know, Vicodin. OK, um, you build up a tolerance for it. So that turned into, you know, Percocets, then Oxys. And, you know, fast forward over almost 20 years, I ended up on a uh, drug called fentanyl. Oh, wow. That's quite powerful opiate. Yeah, it's actually um, I read somewhere that it's actually stronger than morphine. Um, and it's highly addictive. And what made this kind of even worse is with uh, it was time release. So basically, while I was sleeping, you know, whatever I was doing, I always had this constant supply of fentanyl. 
So it's a it's a great recipe to make a really good, you know, addiction for it. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I was in pain and I was in chronic pain and there were sometimes, you know, four or five days would go by and I hadn't slept. And that makes you a different person. Absolutely. Chronic pain is a terrible thing. So um, so moving along, you know, we, we got really busy. We had kids at a young age as well. And. You know, we started with the running the kids to practices and the school events, and we got really busy. And, you know, we were just in this whirlwind of trying to, you know, pay bills and keep the kids going. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of time to cook at home. Um, not, not that we really ever did. But where I ended up, you know, in my mid, mid to late 30s is we were um, eating out you know, ordering pizza and wings probably four or five nights a week. And then we'd go to a restaurant at least one night a week. Um, and I was eating fast food, you know, no less than, you know, three, maybe two, three times a day. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And th that was like every day, even like on the weekends, I would catch myself getting up in the morning and just going to McDonald's or Burger King and, you know, getting breakfast sandwiches. That was my thing. Yeah. I can so, relate to that. I, I used to eat a lot of those as well. Yeah, and you think because they're coming from a quote unquote restaurant that it's food, you know. That's right. Um, and I, and I think personally, I mean, I don't have any education in this, but I think that you know I would go eat two sausage biscuits with egg and cheese, and a half an hour later I was hungry. I think I was actually starving to death, even though I was over four hundred pounds, because I was starving for nutrients. Absolutely, you you were obese, but. Um, malnourished. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people don't understand that, but I totally, totally believe that. Um, and, you know, then the other thing is our, our lifestyle. I live in kind of a rural area. And like I said, I grew up on a farm, um, you know, big time into hunting and fishing. And, um, you know, we have a lot of cattle and, and stuff around here. In fact, there's literally um, a butcher shop you know, within an eighth of a mile from my house. Okay. So, you know, when we, we would buy meat, it would be like we would buy a half of a cow or a half of a pig. There were weekends that me and my two friends would actually make over 300 pounds of sausage. And I had a big smoker and, you know, I had all the stainless steel equipment. Um, so heavy into like pepper sticks and sausages and stuff. But in my mind, it was healthy because I knew where it was coming from. We weren't buying it from the store. You know what I mean? Yeah, you were doing it yourself. So therefore, it had to be healthy. Right, right. Because I knew everything that was in there. So yeah, so I mean, as time marched on, um, I ended up at about 38 years old, you know, over 400 pounds. And my life basically was the couch and bad food. Um, and do as little as I possibly can to, uh, you know, just to get to work, get a paycheck. But yeah. I was also, you know, constantly in immobilizers and, you know, canes and crutches. And the heavier I got, you know, the worse it was for my joints, the less I would do, the more I would eat. And it just it just snowballed into this, you know, terrible existence to where I just I hated my life. It was a slippery slope. Each thing led to a worsening of the situation. Correct. So what changed for you? I think it was a, you had a doctor's appointment that kind of opened your eyes or? Well, you know, I, it seems like, and, and I kind of get caught doing this too. I always want to put my finger on that one thing that changed, but you know, I, I pretty well connected with a lot of people. My story, in fact, I actually should have started off my talk with you about this. I, I always try to start my interviews off that, you know, when I do presentations, I even have a slide for this. You know, my story is really cool and I'm not trying to take away from it. And I'm very blessed and I'm very thankful and I'm very grateful. But at the same time, I didn't do anything, you know, that's that's crazy that no one else can do. Um, what I did is 100 percent repeatable and it's out there for anyone. There's nothing special about me. I didn't do anything, you know, out of the ordinary. In fact, one of my slides, it says, I'm literally just a fat guy that ate a bunch of apples. So, but. Well, and I think that's kind of the wonder of it though, right? Like, I think your story is remarkable and it is extraordinary because not a lot of people are doing it. That's what makes it extraordinary. But when you break it down, eating whole food, plant-based and reclaiming your health isn't hard to do. Anyone can do it. Right. We just haven't made it normal yet. 
Right. And, you know, so my point is now I'm kind of I was on an island for a long time, but now that I'm connected with a lot of friends, their story is so similar to mine. Um, and I, I don't want to get too far out in the weeds, but the reason why I say this is when because I, I really because my passion is to help other people with this. And yeah. so I try to look at similarities between our stories and there are a lot. Um, and unfortunately, the one common theme with most of my plant based friends is some kind of tragedy happens and it shouldn't have to be like that. You shouldn't have to wait for that. But. Other than that, everyone has their own path, their own reason, because I wish I could find this pattern. And if I, yeah. you know, bottle this pattern up and give it to people and say this, you know, this is what you need to do. But it doesn't work like that. But that said, the flip side of it, people that once they transition, I can almost guarantee the three things that will keep them in the plant based lifestyle. Um, and one of the big ones is, you know, connecting with other people and Absolutely. You know, giving back. And then uh, one of the themes that I see through everyone, you know, on the other side is gratitude. And that actually, I think, was the first thing that changed for me. Um, sometimes I have a very mechanical mind. And sometimes, you know, I look at this like puzzle that all these little points have to line up for, you know, a mechanism to work. And. I think it was a series of events um, and I would never want to reproduce those events, but um, probably one of the first things that really made a change in my life was, um, as I said, my wife and I were, you know, high school sweethearts. We got married young and we were very close to each other's families because you know, at 15 years old, you're hanging out at the other person's house all the time. So, you know, yeah. we, we were very close and um, we got a my, my mother-in-law, who um, was my wife's best friend in the whole world. Um, she was sick, but like she had the flu or a cold or whatever, but she just wasn't getting better. So uh, we took her to the emergency room because she was like really like sick enough. She couldn't get out of a chair. And after they ran some tests, um, they found out that she had um, leukemia. Oh, dear. And um, it was a huge, huge head. She, she was super, super sick. Um, and we got kind of immersed into this world that we knew nothing about. You know, instead of just worrying about how we're getting through the week, we're trying to figure out who's going to go spend time with her mom, you know, up at yeah. our big cancer hospital here is Roswell Park. And... You know, and then as a side note, you know, later on, um, as we're dealing with that, my father, who was my best friend in the whole world, um, he was diagnosed with kidney cancer and uh, he was given six months to live. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So our life uh, really, really took a turn, you know, hard. Um, and, and, you know, I think back to me where I was on this couch making bad food choices. I was also, you know, I was an addict. Um, my life was about how I could escape, you know, just how I could get a break. I just need a time out from life. So yeah. I did anything I could, you know, and that, yeah, it included food and, and the prescription drugs and, you know, whatever else I could get my hands on. Um, and my whole life became so self-centered on me and how I could escape. I just you know, got caught up in this trap of bitterness and all the things that were wrong. But as I'd walk, you know, out of the hospital after spending time with um, my dad or her mom, you know, she was in the pediatric wing one time and you see these kids, you know, that they lost their hair from chemo and they have masks on because every, you know, their immune system's very yep. compromised. Um, and you'd see them playing around and you know, I turn, I realize these kids have parents and family and I'm walking out of the hospital thinking, you know, I'm complaining about my knee hurts or my braces are putting, you know, cuts in my legs. And but I'm walking out of this hospital and I don't have chemo running through my veins. And, you know, it just started making me think that, you know, I should be more grateful for what I do have instead of being so bitter at what's wrong with me. And I, I think a catalyst in that, too, was we went up to visit her mom and I was the first one to walk in the room. And, and you know, at this point, she was just struggling to stay alive one more day. She was just fighting with everything she had just to stay alive. 
And I remember her, we walked in and her eyes opened up real slow. And the first thing out of her mouth was, how's your knee? And it, it just crushed me. I mean, she was an awesome lady and that's why she asked that, but it just crushed me because here, you know, she's trying to live one more day and she's worried about my stupid knee and, you know, yeah, my knees hurt, but I got legs and she can't even get up on her own. It gave you some perspective. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely, um, uh, you know, put a different lens on my glasses. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, to s- spare all the details, um, her mom, her mom lost her battle and she passed away. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thanks. And, and then my father who was given six months, he made it six weeks and, and he passed away too. And, Oh my goodness. Both of them were, you know, very hard fought battles and, uh, it was, it was a terrible thing to go through. And, you know, I mean, obviously there was a, a ton of pain that was attached to, to of course. losing our two best friends, you know, our two parents and well, and so close as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we tried to get some kind of normalcy back into our lives. I mean, as, as normal as you can. And, um, you know, one day, um, Heather used to put my socks and shoes on me most mornings so I could get to work. And, you know, I might be able to, if I set it up right, I could probably get my shoes on without tying them or, you know, you learn how to manipulate and tie them from the side or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it was just easier to have her put them on. And I can remember looking down at her face and, you know, you just seeing the pain, you know, still so fresh in her eyes. And I thought to myself, I'm next. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, if I did live another year, um, if she's putting my socks and shoes on me now, what's next year going to look like even if I lived? Like, how is she going to take care of a 400 pound plus guy, you know, in a wheelchair? Yeah. Um, We found out later from a doctor um, that his job was just his goal you know, as my doctor was to keep me out of a wheelchair for another 30 days. So, I mean, I was in bad shape. Uh, you know, my my metabolic numbers were off the charts. My blood pressure was 255 over 115. Wow. Um, and that was on two different medicines, sometimes three. Um, my cholesterol and triglycerides were, you know, through the roof. And um, I was in I was in bad shape. And I knew I knew I was next. I knew our life was going to change big time soon. You were just preparing for it to happen, essentially. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was a part of me that, you know, I knew, you know, you rationalize this stuff because I do, I have a genetic disease and, um, you, I mean, I, still to this day, I mean, I, I pull on my thumb, it comes right off my hand. It's pretty weird. Oh. Um, so I could, I could rationalize it and, you know, I was in legitimate pain and, you know, yeah, I was abusing prescription meds, but, I was abusing them because I, I didn't want to be in pain. Yeah. Um, so I could sit and rationalize it. But at the same time, you know, watching two people struggle for their lives that you love so much. Humans are capable of amazing things when they're struggling. And I don't think I was doing that. I don't think I was fighting at all. I, you know, seeing seeing someone fight just to sit up in bed. You know, it kind of gives you perspective of what, you know, maybe maybe there's something I could change. So I thought, you know, if I could do anything to get out of this mess, I was going to at least try. OK. And so that's when I started, you know, hunting around online and I found these uh, these people that had bariatric surgery. And I can remember sitting, on, you know, for hours, sometimes I'd sit and watch videos of people that were, you know, in similar looking to what I was and um they would get the surgery and a year later they're out running marathons. And I'm like, man, that's what I got to do. Um, I knew I'd never run, but you know, at the same time, any weight I get off my joints, you know, if it kept me out of a wheelchair, then, you know, do it. Absolutely. Uh, any improvement is better than no improvement. Right. Right. I mean, cause I was at the point where just getting in and out of my truck, like that was an ordeal, you know, getting out of a chair was like a big, you know, that was a workout. Um, and, and again, yeah, at 400 pounds, I mean, if you, you know, put that kind of weight on a normal person's back, that's a lot of weight. It is. Yeah. But on top of that, you know, I had this, uh, have this joint thing too. So I figured, you know, if I get some weight off, even if I do it with surgery, it'll at least get me going in the right direction. So I called a, a company here in Buffalo 
that does them. And um, I went to like a little conference on the, you know, the difference between the lap band and the sleeve. Um, and part of me wanted the lap band. And I think because I wanted a way out, it was like it was easy to remove and you could actually change it like kind of on the fly. OK. Um, but they also told me that the sleeve was probably a, a more a viable option. So at any rate, I had everything all set up. And all I had to do was go visit my primary doctor and get him to sign off on the surgery. And, you know, I had been seeing him probably twice a month at this point um, and then calling him quite a bit for prescriptions as well. So Hmm. um, he knew me pretty well and he knew Heather pretty well. And he sat me down and he said, you know, I've signed off every person that's brought me an application. I've signed off. And he said, I'll probably sign off on everyone after you. But. I can't sign this for you. And his reasoning was, first of all, I was on so many uh, pain medicines. um, He wasn't sure how I'd react to the anesthesia. Okay. And then also he was worried if I lost weight rapidly that I would end up in a wheelchair and uh, never get out again. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, I thought, you know, this guy just signed, signed my death warrant. That's what he did. He killed me. Um, and I can remember coming home and I was so mad, um, I didn't know what to do, but I figured I went this far. I, you know, I stepped out of my comfort zone to at least look at some changes. I'm like, maybe I should just go on a diet like everyone else. Yeah. Um, and my family, uh, they were into diets, you know, the whole time growing up. My mom is like a professional dieter and yeah, she's been on everything from the cabbage soup diet to the Tic Tac diet, you know? Oh, my goodness. Um, So, you know, I knew how it worked. And I actually did Atkins a few years before that. And I I did lose like 50 pounds. But then I gained it back, you know, with a little extra. Um, Which is typical of dieting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I, you know, I a couple of things that happened that I think were actually good. It was a good start. Um, I started writing down like what I was eating. So I made like a, a food log. Um, so at least I was being conscious of what I was eating. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I started like swapping, you know, the red meat for Turkey. So I told you we were processing a lot of meat, um, yeah. uh, over Thanksgiving time when Turkey's going. So we, we'd go down and buy like five of them. And then, you know, I'd make like Turkey burgers up for a few months and switch them for, you know, the hamburgers or, okay. Um, same with the cheese, you know, I went to a lower fat cheese, I would eat mozzarella instead of cheddar and, you know, the skim milk and all that stuff. And and the stuff that I think most Americans do to, to lose weight. Yeah. So you, you switch to what you considered the healthier option, but no, now is not really the healthier option. Correct. And I mean, honestly, on Atkins, I thought eating, you know, pork rinds dipped in blue cheese dressing with Slim Jims. I thought, you know, that's really healthy. That's you know, because there's no carbs in any of that. So yeah, carbs are the are the enemy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing is, I started writing this stuff down, and I actually, I started keeping a journal, which is totally out of character for me. Um, and I I would start off the day, I'd actually write down a prayer, you know. And my prayer wasn't so much for a miracle to lose weight; it was just for enough strength to change one thing a day. And this was kind of a different attitude for me because it wasn't just a push button, have the surgery, get fixed thing. It wasn't a quick fix. Yeah, it was just about getting strength to just change one small thing. So, like, for example, um, I saved this book, too. It's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool to look back at. But, you know, the first day I decided to actually move a little bit more. It was uh, to get out of my office chair twice instead of once. And the reason why I picked that is because the week before I went to get out of my chair and I pushed down so hard on the handles, uh, the arms of the chair that I broke both of them off. Oh, wow. Um, So, yeah. So I had to get a new chair. So that was kind of embarrassing. But I so I stood up out of my chair. I sat down and then I stood up again. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but that was like a big deal for me to, to do that twice. And well, and they say to move a mountain, you start with a small stone, right? Right, right. You know, I didn't know at the time where I just knew that that's what if I could do it once, I could do it twice. And yeah, you know, same with the stairs. I'd walk up three stairs and take a break. And well, what if I could walk up four and not take a break? Um, and so, yeah, you know, 
when you're taking in 8,000 plus calories a day of fast food and you know, you're over 400 and you make a subtle change like that. I mean, you get results and you get them, you know, in a, in a pretty big way. Well, and you're, you're moving 400 pounds up an extra stair. That's not a light amount of weight to be moving. Right. Right. And so, you know, obviously results happened. I mean, um, I started feeling lighter, but at the same time, I wasn't really feeling better. Um, I was okay. still constantly inflamed. In fact, to the point that my eyes would actually, um, I, I look at some of my pictures and it just, it looked like my face was just hurting because it was so puffy that my eyes were almost shut. Oh, wow. So I didn't like, I didn't lose any of that stuff, but I was getting lighter. Um, so I could, I could feel a little difference that way, but. So how long did this go on? How long were you, uh, adding incremental changes? I don't know, a couple months maybe. Um, okay. But you know, I was, I was, I was moving in a direction. I was conscious about trying to get better, I guess. And I think that's, that was key. Um, and I wasn't quitting. I had bad days and then I, I, you know, and even in that journal, like I had bad days and I was like, okay, we got to get up in the morning and do this again. And regardless of the results, you just keep fighting, keep pushing forward. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm sitting on the couch one night and, uh, um, I'm scrolling through Netflix and I see this film called Forks Over Knives. So the story is about Joe Cross comes over from Australia and uh, he spends 60 days in the U.S. in his car with a juicer and he just That's goes across. That's nearly dead. But yes. <laughs> yeah. What did I say? Um, Forks Over Knives. Both of them oh, are I'm great sorry. movies. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, so um, Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead came on. And it's a story about Joe Cross coming over to the U.S. with a juicer. And yep. he, uh, for 60 days, he juices, you know, fresh veggies and fruits. And he has amazing results. He loses almost 60 pounds. He gets off almost all his prescription meds. And um, reverses his autoimmune disease, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, an, uh, an immune disease that um, is, is pretty hard to get rid of. And um, it was almost non-existent when, when the film was over. And I was super inspired by that. I, I was actually in tears by the end of it. Yeah, um, me, me as well, actually. And, you know, by the end of the movie, I actually ordered a juicer. Before the credits were done rolling, I logged on to Amazon and I ordered a juicer. That's awesome. And uh, January 1st was right around the corner. Um, I've never been a fan of New Year's resolutions. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try this for 30 days. And... I'll never forget this because it'll be I'm coming up on four years now from that first juice fast. Um, and the last piece of meat that I ate was pickled herring at 1159. And <laughs> pickled herring <laughs> stuff is so nasty. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, so I started off on, on this juice fast. And um, by the sixth day, um, I was. I, it was like a miracle because I slept through the night and I hadn't slept through a night in so many years. I forgot what that was like. Um, I actually fell asleep and I woke up in the same place I went to sleep and it was amazing. Sorry, um, how many days? Sixth day? Sit on a sixth day. Yeah. Oh, six wow. day. It was, it was crazy. It's how incredible fast. how quick things turn around. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I was feeling better and I could actually feel like inflammation leaving. Um, I wasn't in as much pain. I was feeling more and more energy. And, um, by the second week I was like, man, this, this is amazing. And I was losing over a pound a day. So, you know, by, by day 15, I already had probably 17 and maybe close to 20 pounds off. I didn't write it down, but wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So you, you're feeling the difference. You're lighter, but not, I wasn't just lighter this time. I felt better. Yeah. My skin was better. You know, my acid reflux had disappeared. I mean, I, I had it so bad. Sometimes I would actually aspirate at night, you know, I'd wake up choking. Oh goodness. Um, so yeah, it, it just, I felt better and better and better. And so when I went, you know, back to the couch and turned on Netflix again, it said, because you watch Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead, you know, maybe you'd be interested in Forks Over Knives. And, you know, I just I just saw Dr. Osselstyn a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know, that movie didn't just save my life. It gave me a brand new one. Absolutely. Uh, I'm such a big fan of his. Yeah, he's he's a cool guy. <laughs> the funny story, I, I showed him a before picture um, the first time I met him and he looked down at the picture and he goes, 
my, weren't you a chubby one? <laughs> it's funny. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm watching this and I couldn't believe it because, you know, I'd never heard of plant based before. And, and honestly, you know, where I live and, and the company I was keeping, I didn't even really know what a vegan was, to be honest with you. A lot of people uh, are confused by that term. Yeah. Well, I didn't even know what, I didn't know what either of them meant. Like I, you know, after watching the film, I'm like, so it's possible to eat without meat. Like that didn't make sense to me, but I figured, you know, what I'm doing is great and it's working, but it's not sustainable to just live on juice the rest of my life. Of course. Yeah. Um, so I figured, well, if I just, whatever I'm buying and then, you know, that was another thing about the juicing. It actually, forced me to go shopping like we never shopped and if we did it was like buying a box of you know pizza rolls at a gas station yeah um and the first time i made juice i went and got what i thought was a lot of vegetables and i put them through the juicer and i got like three spoonfuls of juice to drink and i'm like (laughs) yeah this isn't gonna work so (laughs) what it did is it taught me to go searching you know where if restaurants can buy 25 pounds of carrots there's got to be somewhere where i can do the same thing and so yeah You know, to this day, I'm sitting right here next to a 50 pound bag of uh, red potatoes. Nice. We still shop like that. Um, And it doesn't have to be that expensive. But the point is, it got me used to to buying produce and actually shopping. Um, And I thought, man, if I can if I can put this stuff in the juicer, why can't I just eat it? And so that's what I did. You know, I didn't I don't really think I put a, a goal date on it. But after the 30 days, I ended the fast, you know, with an apple and. Um, I just started eating plants. Um, yeah, instead of juicing them down, you you ate them whole. Yeah, yeah, and um, I started feeling better. And you know, people say, "Well, when you juice fast, you gain the weight back." But I was still losing almost as fast eating the food as I was juicing. You know, and my- well, that totally makes sense to me because you're you're getting all that fiber and a lot of the toxins and stuff that you hold in your body are fat soluble so once you give that fiber that's a means for your body to start unloading that right 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 yeah and my my metabolic numbers were starting to you know shake out a little bit and and come back you know not not quite normal but um so yeah and and you know people always see like the physical thing they love looking at before and after pictures and that but you know, the truth is at, at 400 pounds, um, yeah, it's hard to get around. And at the same time, there's a huge emotional anchor that comes with that. I mean, I, I was supposed to be, you know, I, I, I when we got married, I was a young, strong kid. Um, and my wife signed up to marry me um, so I could provide and protect for her. And yeah. here she's trying to take care of young kids. And I'm sitting on the couch while she's mowing the lawn. You know, and it just, man, that does something to you. It does, you know, it, it does something to you. Um, just don't feel right. No. And, you know, the depression sets in and, and you just, yeah, you feel like crap about yourself. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's terrible because I, I don't think, you know, I was suicidal per se, but um, there were nights I'd go to bed and, and I don't know if I'd wake up and, and I don't, I don't know if I really cared one way or the other. I mean, I, I was just, I had no hope, you know, and you were apathetic towards life. Yeah. And it's such a contrast now because I try so hard. We had today off of work and I try so hard to sleep past five o'clock and I just like, <laughs> can't do it. Like four fifty, I'm up and I'm like, man, it's really cool out this morning. I should go for a run or something. It's just, it's so weird how, you know, I feel like I'm going to miss something in life if I sleep too long. So yeah, it's cool to see that contrast, but that's incredible. I haven't quite got there. I still love my sleep, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess during this fast and then afterwards you're eating whole food, plant-based, did you find that, uh, you were adding more to the activity you would do each day is the incremental increase? Yeah. I mean, you know, when I start, like my goal when I started was to live another year and it was just like functional movement, like not be embarrassed that I look at a set of stairs and I'm like, Oh my goodness. Um, so I, you know, as far as goals, I mean, my goals were totally functional. Um, you know, in where I was, I have Ehlers Danlos syndrome. You're not like the doctors had always told me. In fact, I quote, keep your body as quiet as you possibly can. 
Um, so when you sit down, make sure the chair has arms on it to, to lift the weight. Don't ever leave things hanging, you know, like your arms hanging because they're just constantly trying to get out of the sockets. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I did. I mean, I, I kept my body as quiet as I could. I changed careers from the factory. I went into teaching um, and I got to the point where I could almost teach the whole day and hardly stand up out of a chair. Um, so my goals were a hundred percent functional and there was no, my wife would ask if, if I wanted to go for a walk and I'd be like, what's wrong with the car? You know, yeah. why would you possibly walk when you can drive somewhere? Yeah. But what happened is I started feeling so good, um, that one of the, one of the times she asked me to go for a walk, I'm like, yeah, let's go for a walk. Um, so we actually drove to go walk, but we drove to, uh, some of the old railroad beds in our area. They turned into bike trails. So, okay. Yeah. I set off and, uh, I was, so your body just told you that it wanted to move. Yeah. Because, you know, I was bored. I had a lot lot of energy I needed to burn off. So I, um, you know, I'm still in braces and stuff. And I think from the pictures, I don't think I had a cane with me that day, but, we walked and um, my plan was to do an out and back, but I made it 0.74 miles and uh, I ran out of gas. So I sat on a bench and she walked back and got the car and picked me up. And that was the first time I ever walked on purpose, you know, mm-hmm. just to walk. Um, and that was 0.74 miles. It took me almost an hour. And I came home and I had to ice down my knees because they were a mess, you know, they were swollen and it hurt. Um, But something wanted me to go back to that trail, you know, a couple days later and and see if I couldn't get a mile, you know. Yeah. And then a mile turned into two. And, you know, I've been an outdoorsman my whole life and I love being outside. And I bought a pair of hiking boots and... You know, the last place you should be with weak joints is walking on trails through the woods. But I love doing it. And, um, you know, that it wasn't easy. I mean, I, there were most of the time I would take an ice pack with me because I knew something was going to, you know, happen while I was back there. But I had trekking poles, which kind of helped me out. And I started walking, you know, hiking trails around around our area. And, you know, one mile turned into two and two turned into three. Um, and I had a friend who who happens to be my cousin um he was in the adirondacks and he got into climbing the high peaks and i didn't know there was such a thing you know and and i mean it's probably about five or six hours from us but i'm like i want to climb one of those yeah and um i set a goal i was still and this was you know earlier on i set a goal to get up um big slide mountain i have no idea why i picked that one but And I wanted to, I wanted to climb that by, um, August, 2012. Okay. So I was still over 300. I still had a a really fancy brace on one leg that they actually casted my leg for. Um, it was a real, you know, carbon fiber and titanium and. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so that, that went up the mountain with me, but, um, it took forever. I think it took us about nine hours. And, uh, honestly, I thought I was going to die a few times. And it probably was a very irresponsible thing I did. Um, But I made it up there. And uh, I can remember I almost felt bad coming home because, yeah, I had worked so hard for that goal. And I'm like, now what? You know, now, now, because what I was doing is climbing stairs. Okay. At one of the places we worked, my wife has a business, so I would help her after my work. And it had three flights of stairs. And I would just... You know, I would just climb those stairs over and over. You know, I'd do one flight and then two flights. And I got to the point where, um, you know, I was doing hundreds of stairs. And that was my training for this mountain. So, yeah. So, everything that was supposed to hurt me more, I actually started getting less and less pain. Um, So, I started ditching some of the pain meds. Um, And I would not suggest this to any of your listeners. I would suggest to go get help. Um, with this, but because fentanyl is a very hard thing to get off from. Uh, Absolutely. It's a very addictive drug. Yeah. So, and, and especially with a patch on all the time, um, what I did is when I'd go to put a new patch on, I would cut a sliver off of it. Um, okay. And I'd keep a template. I actually made a little template <clears throat> and every time I applied a new patch, I'd cut another sliver off of it and it took a long time, but you know, before I knew it, I was actually putting the sliver on instead of the patch. 
Wow, congratulations. That's incredible. But but again, um, looking back, I should have went and got help. I was probably um, maybe too embarrassed or, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I should have gotten help for him. Everyone should consult their doctors when changing medications. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so the less pain I was in, I ended up, you know, shedding all the, the pain meds and all the stuff that goes with them. I mean, I still screwed up a lot. I can remember, I can remember drinking, uh, uh, juice with kale in it. And I can remember the taste of Copenhagen with the kale. And I'm like, this is stupid. You know, I either got to quit chewing or quit drinking this green juice because it doesn't make sense. So, you know, I stumbled a lot, you know, and and I kind of just kind of flailed through it. And um, yeah, so the mountain stumbling is okay as long as you're stumbling in the right direction. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes I think just stumble in any direction because I think the worst thing you can do is nothing. I mean, of course. Yeah. You know, looking back, like I'm so thankful that I didn't get the surgery, but I think it all kind of played a part. Like if, if I wouldn't at least looked at that, I I wouldn't have saw any hope. You know what I mean? So stumble away, just, just move, do something instead of nothing, I guess is, is the key, you know? Yeah. Just don't give up. Right. Right. So then I decided I liked the mountains so much. I actually came back and got my family and we did a couple high peaks together. And, um, you know, I went from not being able to shoot basketball, you know, hoops with my daughter to climbing a mountain with her. And it was just super cool. And then I saw a commercial for a tough mutter and yeah. uh, it'd be super cool. And so I asked who in the family wants to do this craziness with me. And we did that and that was really neat. And, you know, it just kind of it just kind of snowballed as fast as it snowballed forward. It kind of unsnowballed. Um, when we were doing the Tough Mudder, I realized I could jog a little bit. And, you know, we just started working at that. And probably one of the coolest things um, that me and my wife did is we our first uh, 5K was people actually thought there was something wrong at the finish line because both of us were sobbing. So, I mean, it was like tragic sobbing. It wasn't like you know, I'm just happy. Yeah. But yeah, that was like the coolest thing. We ran a 5k without stopping. And like, I never thought that was like so far out there. Um, and then, you know, we said, well, we did a 5k. What about a 10k? And this is for a person who doctors told you not to move. Right, right. And now by this time, my braces are off. There's no more canes. Everything's packed away into, you know, totes in the attic. And that's just incredible. Um, I had the crutches just in case. I'm not, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't perfect. I mean, there were times I'd blow out my ankle. Um, but what I think was happening, because like I don't have like ACLs or anything, all that stuff like tore when I was younger. They didn't even know when it happened. But I think what started happening is as my muscles got stronger, they actually took over the ligaments and tendons. So they compensate it. Yeah. So you don't have ACLs, but if you have really strong hamstrings, it will compensate for that knee slipping forward. Okay. And and another thing is I still, still to this day, when I run, I'm really focused on my form and keeping everything straight in line, my posture, my foot strike. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that part of it too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we ended up the, the, one of the super cool things, um, after we did the 10 K, I told my wife, I'm like, Hey, what about a half marathon? And she's like, no, I draw the line there. I'm not doing a half marathon. I'm like, okay, do you care if I try? And she's like, no. Um, so this is super cool. It actually was in the newspaper. I, I took my handicap parking pass, which was still valid. So the day of the race, I could illegally park in a handicap, uh, parking spot, and I put a picture of my dad and her mom and then a picture of my family, which is my wife and my two children. And then I, I had a friend that was battling uh, thyroid cancer who, who lost his battle. And I put them on the back of this handicap. You know, it's like a piece of vinyl. Yeah. I tied that around my right waist and I carried that to 13.1 miles. That's just this. incredible. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm losing it a little bit here. No, that's okay. Take your time. But yeah, it was just like, you know, a half marathon just seemed like so far out there. And, um, and so then, you know, I, I got home and I, I honestly, I wasn't happy with the time 
of the half because I had I had planned for a little different time. It was slow and I walked a lot of it. So you weren't you weren't happy that you didn't go fast enough on your half marathon. Right, right. <laughs> and of course, you know, I gotta take you know, everyone's yelling at me, you know, and, and you know, and I wasn't taking anything away from it. I just I knew I had a better one in me. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't even change when I came home. I sat down at the computer and I signed up for the next one that was closest in the area. And it happened to be down in ski country in the hills. And um, so I actually, I did like 10 minutes better on that one. But um, so, yeah, so I think since then I've done about uh, seven or eight of them. Um, oh, wow. And so how long, like what, what time frame are we talking here? Like from standing up one extra time from your office chair to running a half marathon, how, how long did that transition take you? No, oh, it didn't take as long as... Um, I don't know. I'm kind of guessing, but like probably like a year and a half, you know? Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, cause, like from it, crutches and braces to running half marathons. Yeah. And it's still, I, I think it's like kind of exponential because even now I complain about just yesterday, I complained about a bad run, but when I look at it from where I was, it's still, I mean, it's still going, my body's still changing. I still have a ways to go. I'm still not where I think I need to be at an ideal weight. Um, but I don't really stress about it. It just kind of happens now. Yeah. But so to finish that up, so in May, um, what kind of got me on the front page of the news and stuff, I actually finished the Buffalo full marathon, uh, this past May, which was a amazing thing. Congratulations. Um, had a bunch of friends around and stuff for it. So it was super cool. They did a really nice um, newspaper article on me and it really, the, he really dug, it was supposed to be like a one or two line blurb in the sports section. It ended up being, you know, Memorial day front page and a whole nother page. It was kind of a big deal. So, Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Cause it was more, you know, it was more about the addiction and all the other stuff and, and the weight loss, but it was kind of a very comprehensive thing. Um, and then the coolest thing, just back here, and and another thing, um, I like cycling too. Um, so I've done a couple hundred mile bike races. We've done a couple metric centuries through the mountains, um, and things like that. Um, but probably one of the coolest things, and you know, all the all the medals and all that stuff, none of that really matters as much as uh, this past August. I told Heather I wanted to climb Mount Washington which is the highest mountain here on the East coast. And so I started planning for it and I said, why don't you come with me to New Hampshire and we'll get an, a nice place to stay in and we'll make like a little vacation of it. Yeah. And she goes, I think I can climb that mountain with you. And I'm like, really? So, uh, we set out, um, it was actually, it was the end of July and we summited at Mount Washington together and, you know, the the cool thing, we're, we were at the cone, the summit cone, and she stood up. We just had finished the apple and, and some trail mix, and she stood up, and I'm helping her put her backpack on. And I couldn't help but think, you know, here she was putting my socks and shoes on a little while ago, and I'm helping her with her backpack over 6,000 feet in there. We're looking down at the clouds. It was just like, it was so cool. How far you came? Yeah, just, you know, so blessed, you know, so grateful and just like, and I feel like every day is like that for me when I get up. It just, you know, it's You've so really cool. got a new lease on life. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's incredible. I, I really enjoy the story because it's, it's true to kind of my message of path mending where you mend your path one stone at a time and however small you might feel that step is every step counts and as long as you're you're pushing forward and you're trying to better yourself you can you can really do amazing things for your health and and that flushes over to every aspect of your life like you're happier you're fitter you're you want to move more you truly enjoy life more yeah. And, you know, the other thing about that, too, is we know that, you know, there's many illnesses that are contagious. Well, health is contagious, too. And, yeah. um, you know, I can tell people whatever I want to and most people won't listen. I wouldn't have listened, you know, yep. but when they see how you live and they see your passion, they want what you have. And, yeah. you know, it's contagious. My, my wife never you know, she never set out on 
plant based, any of this stuff. And, you know, she ended up losing over 50 pounds. So it's incredible. You know, it's it spreads too. So it's cool. Well, yeah, and a, a person isn't going to change unless they want to change. Like we touched on this a little bit at the beginning where um, you can't convince someone. And it's such a deeply held belief of what's healthy, what isn't healthy, their way of life. It's They live it every day. So unless a person really wants to change, there's really not much you can say to have them change. And it usually takes something tragic or s- something big to shake that belief and and lead them down a new path right right yeah everybody wants to be comfortable and that's that's the worst place you can be really absolutely you grow on the edge of your comfort zone right right that's incredible thank you so much for sharing your story is there anything else you want to touch on or i just i just honestly like um i feel like if if i didn't think that this was out there for anybody i I would totally be wasting my time with this and Hmm. You know, I'm really passionate. Like I, if, if people are really serious about changing, I'll give them my cell number, you know, find me somewhere. Um, it's so cool now, too, because I told you how my doctor wouldn't sign off for my surgery. Yeah. Um, I got a phone call about, I don't know, seven weeks ago. And it was this guy. And he said, um, your doctor, I won't say names, but he said, your doctor told me to give you a call. And I'm like, OK. And he, my doctor's done this before. I give him permission to give my cell phone number out. And um, he said, listen, I was all set to go for a bariatric surgery. And he told me he wouldn't sign it until I talk to you and wait 60 days. Yeah. And I'm like, cool. But at the same time, you know, I've been trying to help as many people as I can. And some people I'll invest a bunch of time into. And, um, you know, I'll see him like you know, on Facebook, eating a steak dinner or something. It's like, you know, I couldn't yeah. use that time for someone that actually wants to change. So yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, a little apprehensive about just jumping in full bore now. But it was funny because I was doing um, a talk at VegFest, Western New York VegFest, like the day before he called me. And I'm sorry, the day after he called me. And so I said, listen, I want to get together with you tomorrow, but I have to go speak at VegFest. And I'm like, hey, you should come out there, you know. And um, so he did. And, and the cool thing is he's kind of he's kind of exactly where I was. And, you know, and again, living where, where we do, um, VegFest is not something you would do. <laughs> yeah. You know, usually the things we do, you wear camo to. Uh, We're the crazy ones that go to things like veg. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I still am. I'm still, I'm still kind of, uh, um, yeah, I have like, I have meat tattooed on my arms. I'm not even kidding. Um, so I'm still kind of an outlier at, at these kind of things. But so he came out and, uh, he heard my story and afterwards he stayed after and he goes, you just, everything you said, you described me to the T. So long story short, I said, listen, why don't you come over for dinner? You and your wife come over for dinner. We'll have burgers and fries. Um, you know, I didn't tell him it was veggie burgers and uh, (laughs) potato wedges, but we did. So, you know, and the funny thing is usually I have, uh, forks over knives, DVD to hand them and stuff. And I had given my last copy to my doctor. So I had to order more, but I said, you got to look, you got to watch forks over knives. And I handed him a copy of starch solution, the book from, um, Dr. McDougal. Yeah. And he took it home and I kind of in my mind, I'm like, yeah, we'll see what happens. And then all of a sudden he's texting me pictures and cause he had a smoker too. Right. And he's out there like smoking this awesome looking, you know, veggie whole grain pizza. And it looked amazing. And he's like texting me pictures of all his food, no oil food and stuff. That's awesome. It's incredible to see someone jump on board. Yeah, like, and he, he, this guy knew nothing. Like, he just totally, you know, stumbling into it. He read, he read Starch Solution in like two days. But so what happened is he just had his checkup last week. And uh, actually, I'm reading his text at work and I started crying because his triglycerides were over 400 and they're in half. Wow. Um, Same with the cholesterol was over four. And the cool thing is the doctor looked at the computer screen. And he looked at him and he got up and he left and he thought that they had the wrong patient. 
Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's how much his numbers change. And, the, the, I mean, there's no chance he can get surgery now. You know, he's he lost, I think, what did he tell me? It was it was a crazy amount of weight that he lost. That's the incredible. Pounds, you know, and he said he feels great. He goes, I can work. I can work, you know, around kids that are half my age. And he says, I can feel like I can work for 20 hours a day. So that kind of stuff just blows my mind. That to me, that stuff is so much more enjoyable than where I've been, you know? Yeah. I usually ask my guests, what is one piece of advice that they can give to pathmenders that are listening now? But that is just a perfect example. Just watch forks over knives, read the starch solution, get more educated. It's really not that hard. No. And to me, um, most of the time when people reach out to me for help, um, I tell them watch forks over knives and then get back to me. And this is the way I see it. If you watch Forks Over Knives and you don't want to change, then you don't want to change. You know what I mean? I mean, that sounds harsh, but it's true. Yep. Well, and you only have a finite amount of time, so you have to spend it wisely. Right. But I mean, if that if that film isn't compelling enough to give up animal products, nothing I can say to you is going to. Yeah. You yeah, know, exactly. I can I can show you two hundred pictures right now on my hard drive of before and after pictures of plant based transformation. But you know, that's not going to change your mind if Forks or Knives hasn't. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So you run a blog, Fat Man Rants. Do you want to direct people to anywhere? Yeah, sure. I I have no idea what I'm doing with any of this stuff. Um, <laughs> I actually, I, my goal is to write a book, which I found out is really hard when you're doing all the social media stuff. I need to really focus. I need to use the same mindset for my physical activities as I do for the book. Yeah. Um, but I thought it'd be cool as I'm writing to, to share some of these things out on a blog. And I guess if no one ever reads them, fine. Um, they're out there, you know, at least they're saved. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and like I say, I have no idea if this is good, bad, cause I don't know anything about this, but I think I've had close to 60,000 people in about 11 months on my site. Wow. That's awesome. Um, and then I said, well, I need a place to share my little blog post. So I started a Facebook page mainly, honestly, because I didn't want my, you know, I had like 300 Facebook family and friends and I'm like, they're getting so sick of hearing me. So I'm like, <laughs> Oh, you can volunteer to hear me on Fat Man Rants on Facebook. Um, and I think I'm getting close to 5,000 people on that page already. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool, too. And it, it's really neat. Probably the coolest thing about all this um, is connecting with all these like-minded people. Um, and, you know, Jason Cohen, I don't, are you familiar with the project Big Change? No, I'm not. Um, so super quick. Um, actually he's probably somebody you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, mind interviewing. Uh, Jason okay. Cohen is, uh, he's a film director, even more a photographer than anything, uh, down in Louisiana. And he was on his bike trainer one day and he's like, he loves, you know, the plant pier nation forks over knives, all that. But yep. he's like, there's nothing out there. That's like a hundred percent inspiration. You know how, when you see some of the stories in forks over knives, like, the one girl that had diabetes, it's, it's really moving to see that part of it. Absolutely. Well, that's really what inspired my podcast, actually, is like I would read the, one of the first books we read was Eat to Live by Dr. Furman. And in the beginning of each chapter, he would have one of those success stories. And I'd find myself tearing up listening to it. There's just incredible the changes people have. And I'm like, people need to see this. This needs to be blanketed everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. So, and that was Jason's thing that what if you could make a film that's just about big change that, that changes out there for anyone. Yeah. Uh, So he found Josh Lajani down in Louisiana and he happened to be just like a couple hours away from him. Um, So what he did is his idea is for four people to be in this documentary. And he just basically just fouls you around um, and kind of documents your life, where it was, where it is, and super inspiring. The teaser is out for Josh's already. Um, and he actually came up here this summer and spent about a week with us. And uh, they had drones following us around our bikes. And super oh, that's awesome. 
yeah, really good quality. He's very good at what he does. But the best part is um, he lost 120 pounds. Um, and I think he's kept it off for, I don't know, maybe five or 10 years. I don't even know. But wow, so that's he's awesome. got his own story. And his story is super cool. Um, one of his friends was moving out of town, and he gave him a bike. Oh. And he looked at it like, what am I going to do with a bike? And uh, the rest is history. He kind of stumbled his way on and then ended up finding a uh, plant-based uh, lifestyle too. So super cool guy. But I said all that to say um, when Jason, his podcast, he interviews a weekly podcast just for inspiration. I think he's like 3,500 pounds of cumulative weight off of his guests already. Oh, wow. Um, and the stories, I mean, they are just mind boggling. Like, you know, my friend Dave uh, Wiltis, he, he flatlined four times. He got shot like 11 times. Oh, man. So like literally, you know, I don't know if it was right in the hospital or right after the hospital. He uh, emailed Dr. Esselstyn and like within 20 minutes, the guy's on the phone with him like just chatting with him and uh here this guy went you know from flatline and he's out there running marathons right now it's i mean th the stories are so like crazy cool yeah um, but it just it made me think i'm not on an island anymore you know that, that my story is cool but there's you know thousands of people out there with almost the same story yeah and that's the crazy thing about it is like you the first time you hear the first story you're like this is miraculous like no drug comes close to this this is incredible and then you hear more and more stories like it and you realize that it's it's not all that spectacular no right? it's, it's, the norm. it's achievable it's the norm you know? yeah <laughs> results are typical <laughs> yeah really. right yeah um so that's incredible well, th thank you so much again for joining me. I've really enjoyed listening to your story. Thanks for opening up and sharing with uh, the Pathmenders. Yeah, it's been great. And thank you for having me, Chad. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I really hope you've enjoyed. If you have, please share with your friends and family. Let's give everyone the opportunity to mend the path they're on. Together, we can all get back to better. Visit